Hey everyone, Cody Hayes here, and I'd like to welcome you to part two as we look at utilitarianism from the perspective of John Stuart Mill, J.S. Mill. And this is where we left off, and to rehash very, very quickly, um, Mill had a number of problems with the utilitarianism put forward by Bentham, one being that Bentham never really considered the happiness of the utilitarian, and of course, you know, the whole game of numbers but seeking the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. But if you're not within that greatest amount of good, your own personal happiness, well, your own personal happiness has to be sacrificed for others. And then, of course, utilitarianism as a game of numbers, and Mill points out how, you know, it's not all about numbers. You know, quality matters. There's quality in a product not just quantity, not just numbers, or, you know, there are higher pleasures and there are lower pleasures, and the higher pleasure always wins out. Well, for Mill, having a series of rules, or what can be called rule utilitarianism, will achieve the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, including the utilitarian, and I'll explain. The notion is that if we have a series of rules, everybody will be factored in, including the utilitarian himself or herself. So because he or she is part of the rule, he or she's personal happiness is not, in theory, going to be sacrificed. Uh, to give an example, this class, in many respects, functions on rural utilitarianism in that, you know, I've created a series of rules and that hopefully it will achieve the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. Is it perfect? No, but nothing is perfect. Well, even though Mill tried to fix what he thought were some of the flaws in Bentham's method, uh, there are still some criticisms of the utilitarianism put forward by Mill. One is that higher pleasures and lower pleasures are not universal. I mentioned how, you know, a previous example in the ethics textbook talking about the couple that wants to go out and eat French cuisine and then go home and watch Masterpiece Theater versus the girl selling flowers down on the square so she can make enough money to go to the liquor store and buy herself a bottle of gin that um, Mill would have trouble with saying both scenarios are fine in of themselves so long as they're achieving the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. From Mill's perspective, again, there's the higher pleasure and there's the lower pleasure. And for Mill, the higher pleasure would be eating the French cuisine and then watching Masterpiece Theater. And that from his perspective, the girl selling flowers so she can go get a bottle of gin and then get drunk on that bottle of gin, that's the lower pleasure. But if she was to experience the higher pleasure eating the French cuisine and then watching Masterpiece Theater, she would not go back to that lower pleasure unless she had no choice. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember once when I explained this point of view from Mill, the students in the class, I could tell that they understood the argument from Mill, but I could also tell by their body language it did not personally affect them in that essentially, you know, what Mill might consider to be the higher pleasure, they didn't necessarily consider to be the higher pleasure. And that's where, you know, it's not necessarily universal. Um, to give another example, you know, I explained the higher pleasure and the lower pleasure with working to earn your pay versus panhandling. Well, here's a story that uh, someone I know told me. This individual uh, worked for Ace Hardware. I don't know if he still does, but he did at the time. And he was telling me how 
out in the parking lot at Ace, there were a number of people panhandling and word about this reached the manager and he came out and confronted them and said I'll hire any one of you right now that wants to go to work and I'll start you off at ten dollars an hour or whatever it was and what I understand not a single one of them took it now you know, again, Mill would say, you know, working to, you know, earn your pay is the higher pleasure. And once you've experienced that, you would never go to panhandling unless you've had no choice. I'm sure that a lot of those individuals out there probably work to earn their pay at some point in time, but they didn't see things as Mill necessarily would. But again, that's the point that's being made here, is that higher pleasures and lower pleasures are not necessarily universal. Another criticism is that having a rule still does not take into excuse me, account a person's intentions. I think of the notion of zero tolerance in public schools, which I guess is still uh, being enforced. I know certainly it was at one time. But the thing with zero tolerance is there's just that. There's no tolerance. And everybody is treated the same. The problem is, not everyone is the same in the situation. But the idea is very much in harmony with rural utilitarianism. That we've created this rule. Everyone's factored in. Everyone will follow it. And it will create the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. But the thing with the zero tolerance is that perpetrator and victim are both treated the same. The problem is they're not the same. But under the zero tolerance policy they are treated the same in that they're both punished. But there's a difference between the two. And that's not being factored in here. So that's all that we have for uh, J.S. Mill and his utilitarianism, rural utilitarianism it's often called. So if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me a message in the Q&A form or send me an email. Till then, take care.